You're listening to iCannabisRadio.com. Hello, and welcome to In the Lab with Jennifer and Jill. Hi. And our special guest today, Chris Peck, who is uh, the laboratory tech at Can Labs. Hi, Chris. Hello. How are you? Good, thank you. <laughs> Poor Chris got put on the spot today, so, but we're going to break him right into radio. Yay. Quick like. But before we get to anything, what are we going to be talking about, Jill? Today? What oh, are we announcing? Yeah, sure. We're, anna- <laughs> <laughs> we're announcing our um, Cannabis Cup winner, which is awesome. Yay. Yay. Um, he was supposed to, we were supposed to call him and embarrass the heck out of him, but we have to record early today because of the multitude of meetings this afternoon. So we can't talk to Brian, but Brian is from Washington, D.C., and he got all the answers right. And I do have to mention that. He was not actually the first person to get all the questions right, but the first person was under 21. And so unfortunate. And actually, I should give him a shout out. And we should send him some swag. We will, are definitely sending him some swag. But we feel um, bad, but legally we cannot put under 21-year-olds in a hotel room and set them free in Denver on 420 weekend. So that's exactly we'll have to right. do this again in like two years because I think what, he was 19. He was 19. And we also had a young woman that answered, too, and got all but one right. So she was really close, too. So I'm glad we have the young audience. So do I. And taking such an interest in science, I mean, um, the sad part is, is I know that it's mainly my fault. And I apologize. It's the first contest we've done here. But, um, yeah, I just kind of assumed that since it was for the cannabis cup and you have to be 21 years of old uh, years or older to consume that uh, we didn't have to announce that every time. So I apologize for that. I did say that you had to be over 21 um, on one of the shows, but clearly I should have said it every show. So I so apologize and I hope you continue to listen. And for those two people, um, I will be getting out some, some swag, hopefully some good swag. But um, so Brian, so Brian, yeah. gra- Brian's great. Brian's an activist as well, and um, when he was in college, worked with Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Oh, and is still an activist. He's working on um, SSDP, which I adore. Love that organization, and their executive director Aaron Houston. They do so much amazing work, and it was really the SSDP kids who probably won 64. They came out in mass from all over the country to volunteer, make phone calls. And what is SSDP again? Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Okay. So it is a campus organization at all schools and students can start their own chapter and it is just an amazing amazing group of kids and they work their butts off. Um, and generally quite a few of them grow up to work in drug policy. So if you dream of working for like MPP or... Marijuana um, Policy Project. Yep, 64 campaign and to further move our movement along, SSDP is a great place to start. But so now he's currently working on the Amplify Project, which is trying to get a table at Red Rocks. So hopefully we can help. I'm going to try to help make that happen. Um, it's a project of SSDP that connects activists with artists who support drug reform policy. So they kind of work with um, musicians and different artists and do really cool group events. So I'm really excited that Brian is so involved in the movement and won. So he's so excited. There's no way that he and his um, fiance could have afforded to come to 
Denver. So it's he's that's so awesome. excited. I wish we could. So him and his fiance. That's awesome. Yeah. So I wanted to give a shout out to Jess Mo- Jessica Mock. She um, actually had one. She answered the extra credit, but she had one wrong. Um, she wasn't the first. Um, it was Kyle. And for some reason, I cannot find his information on here. But Kyle, you know who you are. Thank you so much for listening. And clearly you had been listening all along because you got the answers to us, I think, at 409 or something crazy like that. Yeah, and they were like verbatim. So I could tell when I was looking at people's answers which ones they looked up online right? versus which ones they actually listened to because there was totally different ways we explained things or said things and you could tell when it was. And Kyle had the verbiage down from the shows. So. And Jessica, yeah, just um, just so you know, uh, the one that you did, one of the ones that you missed were the two, wasn't it the two stages of, uh, of a CO2. CO2 machine? And your answer was <gasps> right, but it wasn't what we talked about on, on the, the show. show. So. so the two stages that we are looking for are cr- um, subcritical. Critical and subcritical. Critical and subcritical. And she put liquid gas, I believe. Or solid, but either way, solid I was gas. right. Right. So, so but anyway, uh, <laughs> we want to say thank you so much for um, listening. I hope you continue to listen, and we'll hopefully continue to have great uh, contests. And again, I'd like to say, oh, thank you so much for Blue Sage. They sported huge for two tickets uh, from Washington D.C. to Colorado. And then we also have the clinic who took care of the hotel room, the Marriott downtown. And then um, Atmos, Matt Ellis from Atmos donated the two tickets to the Cannabis Cup. Very exciting. I tried to get Nico on from High Times, but as you can imagine, he's probably super busy. So maybe I can, uh, maybe you can get him on next week. He might even be here next week because I think they come in a week early. I That'd think kind of try. Cool. I think they're so busy though. I think they we are. should get them on at the cup. Like just, we'll definitely get them on yeah. at the cup from two, four to six. I don't know what we're going to do next week. If you have suggestions, email us. Because Jennifer, yeah, where I'm are you gonna going be, to be? I'm going to be in Lake Tahoe for a seminar. It's a uh, three part seminar that I paid a lot of money to do. So I'll be there. It'll be my second uh, time there, and then I have one more time, and then I graduate. Um, Actually, I know what we're going to do next week because I've been working on analyzing the Massachusetts regulations that just came out. And they have, and this has been happening in Maine as well. So Maine's regulations had a prohibition from using any pesticide on a crop. And they found an operator that was using tons of pesticides, some that I feel are okay and some that are not. And so. And the bigger question is could. Could they have flushed or, you know, done something to get the pesticides out of the end product, right? Right. It's the half-life. And and so I'll bring some people on to actually talk about that because maybe Mike will bring Mike back and possibly Ben. Because nothing is labeled for this product, right? It's a federally illegal substance. Sure. And when you go through the approval process for a product – um, EPA, FDA, everybody looks at it and says, okay, this is fine to use on tomatoes you're going to eat because they've studied half-life. Well, nothing is approved for marijuana. So regulators are in kind of a sticky place about what to allow. So they just banned all pesticides. And what I found unusual is they didn't mention fungicides or rodenticides or any of the other evil sides. Molds. Well, molds too. Well, yeah, but you don't apply mold. I mean, you can use compost tea and apply some bacteria, but mold, it's not something you are applying to the plant. Oh, sure, sure, sure. It's something you should test for. Right, right. Um, But so, but the Massachusetts regulations said, first of all, no pesticides. And I actually kind of like this. You have to follow USDA organic standards for cultivation. But the- Wow. Interesting thing is that that allows for pesticides because you need pesticides to grow a plant. Well, it's interesting. And I talked, uh, I've had mixed feelings about that. Can you have a large scale grow with no pesticides? Can you? I don't know. Uh, People I've talked to say it's absolutely possible. Other people say it's absolutely not possible. So I don't know. And if you um, had an extremely sterile environment, possibly. Which is what I think that 
you know, the newer states coming on board want to see after mm -hmm. some of this, some of these other things they're learning from our lessons. And again, CAM labs uh, will be testing for pesticides, um, hopefully in the next six months, uh, but don't because we have what's called vertical integration where the grower also is the dispensary owner. And if they're putting pesticides on their flowers, they're not going to pay me to tell them that. <laughs> right. So um, that's caused a huge problem versus California where somebody comes in with cannabis in their backpack and you don't know where it comes from. I would sure hope as a center <laughs> owner that you would test for, for pesticides for your patients. I mean, and even here, people should be testing for that. Um, and that's exactly why we're pre-recording is because uh, Jill and I have to be at the Capitol today at 1.30. They're going all o over the recommendations that were given by the task force, and um, they're going to be talking about vertical integration and also testing. Um, so, but the pesticide thing, it's, it's going to be interesting. And again, we're talking about in inhaling, and I'm really glad Chris is going to join us today because we just started testing for residual solvents. And um, it's interesting because when he's doing his due diligence on it, you know, you have inhaling those. So like in a manufacturing plant, not literally inhaling them, <laughs> of course, but and then you have um, consuming them. So one is OSHA and then um, the other uh, standards or whatever are for consuming them. So we're still um, um, figuring that out, too. But like you said, there's no you know, set standard for if people are doing dabs all day and they have, you know, solvent left over, what's happening there? Like how much solvent is there? And if it's an acceptable amount, but what if they're doing it, you know, 10 times a day? Does that, is that acceptable then? So what our test report shows is the hydrocarbons or residual solvents that we can test for in the headspace. And then, um, what is OSHA's acceptable um, unit parts per million, and then whether they're sample tested above or below. And OSHA is the Occupational Health and Safety Administration, so their main goal is to keep workers safe. So I think the standards also assume that someone is working in an environment where they're exposed right. primarily all day. Is that right? Yeah. Um, the, the Occupational Health and Safety Administration uh, comes out with a lot of uh, exposure limits. And these are typically for eight hour, um, you know, five days a week over a period of 10 to 20 years. So those limits aren't what, exactly what we're looking for. Um, the limits that we test against are called a short-term exposure limit. And that is also from OSHA. And that is for uh, an exposure of a period of less than 15 minutes. And that is more inclined to what we're looking for. And that is an inhalation exposure. The problem we've been running into is trying to find uh, consumable um, exposures. So, for example, when edibles are made, we need to understand how that toxicity is different than when, some, when someone is smoking it. Yeah. Does it, I mean, does this information exist already? Because, you know, herbal product makers use solvents as well as we do. So you have, you know, um, soybean and hexane. Yeah. For example, coffee is a, uh, decaffeinated coffee is something that has been, uh, extracted. The caffeine has been extracted with solvents such as organic solvents like, uh, hexane or, um, methylene chloride. Um, there's some improvements that have been made in the last 10 years, and a lot of the coffee now is being decaffeinated by what's called supercritical CO2 extraction. And that is a much safer method to use because CO2 is practically non-toxic non -toxic to us. So that goes back to the ever-ending, how do you make hash, what's safer, um, et cetera. So um, it's going to be very interesting. My... My thing is, and Can Lab's thing is, safe and effective medicine or adult use. And um, let's keep it to where cannabis has never killed anyone. Um, I would hate to see, and 
you know, five to 10 years that people are dying from contaminants inside the cannabis. That would just be devastating. So we want to make sure that we're on top of that. And I'm going to have Chris uh, talk a little bit more about that. Let's go to break and we'll be right back. Blue Sage Microbes unveils the ultimate in superior soil, Ideal Soil, a 16-quart bag of the best growing soil ever engineered. Superior plant health and vitality is a direct result of the structure and chemistry of your soil. How good is your growing soil? Is your growing soil really balanced? How do you know? Well, Blue Sage Microbes has a newly designed growing soil that is the most advanced growing medium ever offered for cannabis cultivation. This is the only brand in the marketplace that provides growers with an ideal soil structure designed to work specifically with their cultivation systems. You will have your best grow results ever. Call now for a special introductory offer, 888 959 8 Five five one, or log on to bluesagemicrobes.com and experience a new level in growing. That's 888-959-8551. Call Canister at 1-800-420-5757 for all your insurance needs. Canister understands the risks you face each day and we are there to protect your business and your investment. Since 2010, Canister has been serving the cannabis industry nationwide. Call Canister at 1-800-420-5757 or visit us on the web at canister.com to learn more about our insurance and risk management services. Proud member of the NCIA. I'm Gary Johnson, and you're listening to iCannabis Radio, and I want to say, talk it up, Colorado. All right. And Jill is talking to herself. <laughs> I am. I do that a lot. <laughs> Me too. Everyone does. And if they say they don't, they lie. Lie, lie, lie. Anyway, well, let's um, it, uh, let's meet Chris and get into a little bit about his background and everything like that. So tell us about yourself, Chris. Okay. Uh, well, I grew up here in Denver, Colorado. Uh, went to Mullen High School and eventually found myself at Cal Poly in the central coast of California studying environmental engineering. And so I came back to Colorado after graduating there. And uh, the first job I found out of school was uh, working for Jen here at Ken Labs. Woohoo! And it's uh, a lot of the things I learned at Cal Poly I actually have you know, some significance here in the medical cannabis industry and, you know, in the future recreational. Um, what I was doing at Cal Poly was uh, environmental science and sampling and uh, basically looking at contaminants in the soil, in the water, and in the air. And so a lot of that translated really well into this industry where I'm looking at residual solvents in the um, concentrates and edible bases that are being made here in Colorado. Very exciting. And I, I must say, I am, Chris has been my angel. He came along and as ever, all the lab techs at Can Labs, you start out as um, an intern. So he interned for a long time and we finally brought him on board full time. And he is single handedly set up our residual solvent um, uh, protocol, um, mentored by a chemist from Chromadex. Yay. which Chromadex is a huge nutraceutical testing lab out of California with a location in Boulder. So thank you, Keith and Steve, for helping Can Labs out um, to perfect our methodology. So kind of talk about that um, and what uh, – any surprises with it, any not so – I mean, tell me a little bit about it. Well, first off, uh, I have to explain the, the instrument we use is actually different than the one we test for potency with. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, first of all, the potency instrument, the HPLC, or high-performance liquid chromatograph, that's important to use in potency because it doesn't change the chemistry of the sample. It allows us to tell edible makers or uh, patients you know, the level of THC acid or whether they've properly activated their edible. Um, in terms of residual solvents, that is typically done with a gas chromatograph. Um, the setup we have now is a involves a headspace, and I'll go into this you know in more detail in a second. But it's a headspace with a gas chromatograph uh, using flame ionization detection. Yeah, a lot of scientific jargon there, but <laughs> basically we're taking the uh, 
uh, the gas portion of a sample and testing that for solvents like uh, propane, butane, hexane, isopropyl alcohol, um, some of the most commonly used solvents in our industry. And this instrument is important to use because it gives us a quantitative analysis. It lets us not only see what contaminants are in there, but allows us to determine exactly how much of the contaminants are in there. In parts per million, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. PPM. Yeah. Which is different than qualitative, right? Right. The A, a popular qualitative analysis... Qualitative, uh, meaning it can, cannot have a number attached to it. Basically, qualitative is just a yes or no right. answer. Is it there? Yes. So... That, a popular technique for that is called liquid chromatography, and it became popular because of basically the uh, forensics that have been done in the by the department or the uh, DEA, and that's basically for forensic scientists to determine if whatever they're looking at is cannabis or not. Oh, you're talking about no thin answer. layer, thin not layer. liquid. You said liquid. Well, yeah, thin layer chromatography is actually a. a got its roots in liquid chromatography. Uh, oh. It's basically the same idea. You you take a... The idea is it's kind of like if you are writing ink on your paper and you spill water on it and the ink starts to smear everywhere. So you take a sample, you put a little dot on the paper, you watch... Uh, the paper has a certain polarity and you use a solvent that has a good similar polarity and it moves the ink blotch. And by measuring the, you know, the different colors in the... So the area of the ink blotch gives you a, a rough, you know, a qualitative idea of what's in that sample. Right. So that's what you're seeing right there was an example of thin layer. So basically it's like a pH strip, if you will, gives you different colors. So every different color in that sample represents a different um, molecule in the solution. Correct? Yeah. Okay. And the difference on what we're doing is that we're not getting these little colors and little dots to look at. We're actually getting a quantifiable graph that we can use some powerful software to basically count the area underneath the graph. And that gives us a correlation to how much of the contaminant is in the sample. Right. So this is actually just an example of... Um, our high performance liquid chromatography for potency. So as you can tell, way different um, as far as quantitative measure than your little dots on a thin piece of paper. Now again, thin layer has has its you know benefits, but it's more of a identification, not a quantification. Right, and there's been some advancements. For example, they have a technique called UTLC or ultra in their chromatography, and that's more in between qualitative and quantitative. It, it's it's a, basically a cheaper way to get a less accurate result. Sure. And there's some question as to whether the the accuracy is what they claim it to be, or you know whether even whoever's doing the analysis is qualified or is utilizing the correct procedure. <laughs> right. And, and the problem I have with that is um, here in Colorado, you have three different, actually four different people that are testing cannabis. Um, two people have GC, one person has thin layer chromatography, and then we have HPLC. And so people want to give the same uh, sample to everyone and expect the same result. And it just doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, um, thin layer again is qualitative, not quantitative. So if you do get a number out of there, uh, it's about a 50% error range. Now, with that said, sometimes that can hit. Sometimes it will be right, but the majority of times it will not be accurate. So sometimes people may get the same answer and go, well, we, you know, we got the same answer, but you're comparing apples and oranges. And then with gas, you there is so much prep called derivatization that, um, that people aren't doing in order to prep the sample. So uh, those aren't giving accurate results either. So the reason everyone gets different results is different instrumentation, different methods. Now, technically, if uh, gas 
and TLC, if we were um, if they were derivatizing, then we should be getting the same results. But unfortunately, that's not happening. I constantly hear about, and I definitely do not have a very scientific thought process, but I'm constantly hearing about calibration. So what does calibration have to do with different test results? And Go ahead, Chris. Calibrating your instrument is one of the most important scientific aspects of any laboratory. Um, ideally, you want to use reference standards, which are developed by a third party that has nothing to do with your lab. And these are um, highly pure samples that you can run on your instrument to tell the instrument exactly what it's looking at. And we do this for all our instruments at CanLabs, and it basically allows us to generate what's called a calibration curve. And this is used to look at samples, compare them to the reference standards, and get an exact idea of how much uh, material is in it compared to the reference standard. And from there, we generate a number, a result. So are the reference standards different with different companies? So like if we had two labs and they had exactly the same protocols and they used two different reference standards from two different companies, but they both were, you know, top of the line, did everything perfectly, and I sent a homogeneous ground sample to both, would I get the same result? Ideally, yes. And mm -hmm. the reason for that is because these companies that produce reference standards are required uh, to produce with that standard a, what's called a certificate of analysis. And basically, they've done their own testing with their own instruments that have been... Several instruments. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and this has to be reproducible on their end. But they've basically proved that what they have is, or what they say is what they have. So um, can you guys, I've he heard also that you can't get the standards because it's marijuana. Is that accurate or... Um, so Not just you guys, just labs in general can't get THC reference standards. Or Well, when these reference standards are produced, they're, um, they're accepted by the FDA and the DEA, and that qualifies them as being exempt from most drug laws. And the reason for that is because it's such a small amount, and, and it's rendered basically useless. They put these standards in organic solvents like methanol. And that means that if you tried to use the product, it, it would be worthless to you. It would be, yeah, poisonous. So basically, um, THC as acid is uh, the highest um, costing standard right now. It's very volatile. And it costs us um, close to $500 for one milligram per milliliter in methanol. And does that calibrate the machine once? No. It calibrates it, and then you run standards every day to make sure it hasn't got out of calibration, yeah. correct? Yeah, and that, that uh, standard really only calibrates the instrument for that one molecule. We have to buy standards for every cannabinoid that we want to look for. That's – well, and you guys – are we – No, we have two minutes. Okay. Um, I, we're, we're going back to pesticides, I just looked up this report and started reading it because I haven't read it yet, but it's a Government Accountability Office report on pesticide use in tobacco. And it's in here talking about pyrolysis, which is the study of burned tobacco. So when I get got reports from Can Labs, it would say, you know, this is the inactive, this is the active that you're going to get if you are burning it under perfect conditions. Um is that something that you guys do, or how do you determine that? Diff and we should probably maybe hit this after break because it might be a good yeah. long answer. But I w always wondered, like, how on those tests can you tell me ultimately what I'm going to get when I'm smoking? The max. The max. Yeah. Yep. We'll be back and talk about that in a second. Thanks. Tired of dispensary hopping? Trying to find quality meds? Look no further and get to know Greenworks. Our shops are stocked with over 20 strains of organically grown meds, including R4, the highest testing CBD strain in Colorado. Yes, we back up our quality with testing. While Greenworks offers only the highest quality meds, we don't believe in high prices, with eighths ranging from $20 to $40 and ounces capped at $175. With two centers in Denver and one in Glenwood Springs, we're likely closer than you think. 
Call 303-647-5210 to find the location nearest you. The Chocolatiers at Incredibles are dedicated to crafting the finest chocolate from high-quality ingredients to ensure the greatest possible medicated edibles in the world. Consistency and quality are top priority. Lab testing on each and every batch. Rick and Josh have been making non-medicated chocolates for years for such retail outlets as Whole Foods and Vitamin Cottage. Today, we are focused on crafting our award-winning medicated incredible chocolate bars. We are professional bakers and we believe food should be made from scratch. We guarantee your satisfaction. Have an incredible day. Tired of dispensary hopping? Trying to find quality meds? Look no further and get to know Greenworks. Our shops are stocked with over 20 strains of organically grown meds, including R4, the highest testing CBD strain in Colorado. Yes, we back up our quality with testing. While Greenworks offers only the highest quality meds, we don't believe in high prices, with eighths ranging from $20 to $40 and ounces capped at $175. With two centers in Denver and one in Glenwood Springs, we're likely closer than you think. Call 303-647-5210 to find the location nearest you. All right, and we're back. So basically what you what uh, I believe you're talking about is on our report we we report the um, the values that come off the HPLC because again it does not change the uh, molecular structure because it keeps it at room temperature it does not decarboxylate it okay so you're getting your THCA your THC your CBD acid your CBD and your CBN first of all THC is not naturally occurring in the plant neither is CBD it's the acidic forms. So, um, and then of course, THC acid, you, you do heat. So you either smoke, vape, or bake, and that takes the uh, acid off and that gives you your active THC. So what you're, act, you're asking is if you take THC acid and, it, and decarboxylate it with heat, does it um, convert a hundred percent and no, it does not. It converts 87%. So on our report, you'll have to take the THC acid times it by 0.877 and then add the small amount of THC that's in the plant. And that will give you your, what we call the max THC. So depending on whether you're smoking, vaping, or baking, you could get, um, you know, close to that number, but that is the actual max that you will get. Now that 87% comes from uh, research. What's the the swing on that? Like if I'm frying it with a lighter and like killing it, right? Um, am I going to drop down to like 60 or 50? Like, do you know what the range is? Because I find that really interesting. Like trying to figure out, learn how, and I would imagine vaping with a vape that you can set your temperature, Right, you're going to get the best conversion. But like, is it, if max is 87, if I do it completely off, am I going to get 40? Because I know if you're baking and you're trying to decarboxylate and you don't do it properly, you're going to lose a ton. Yeah. And you're going all the way down to CBN at that, in that case, THCA to THC to CBN. But um, I don't know the swing, do you? Well, it's it's hard to say without doing some real experimentation about it. Um, I know that in general terms, combustion, uh, when you're smoking the plant with a lighter, that is going to be way more efficient than vaporization. Um, and we've seen some of the after-vape material that we've tested. It actually has a measurable amount of THC in it. So mm -hmm. you're obviously not getting all out of it. Um, as so lighting it would probably be convert the higher conversion than vaping it. Yeah. Yeah. So combustion typically is more efficient at converting those, uh, THC acid into THC molecules, um, typically more efficient than vaporization. Well, and we're saying, I mean, we're always talking about, um, we've talked about it before we're talking about today, the residual solvent when you're combusting, you're sucking on a butane lighter. So does that like, what's the residue in that? And, um, is that going to compound if you have 
residual solvent left in the hash you're smoking? <laughs> well, that's something that I've been really interested in recently, and I've tried to do a lot of research into that. And unfortunately, there's not very much scientific data out there that's actually measured uh, the exposure someone gets just from the butane lighter. And that's something that's really interesting because depending on how much of an exposure that is, the residual solvent that you're smoking in the wax could end up being negligible or it actually could be really, you know, 50% as much or maybe even more. So it's really up in the air right now as to what kind of exposure you're getting from the lighter itself. Maybe we can get some tests going at I CSU. Know. I think we'll have plenty of people willing to volunteer. But I always wonder if dabs aren't healthier that way then because when you're dabbing, <laughs> easy. You are no. But you're not you're you're lighting a piece of glass to heat your your hash and you're not using directly a lighter on what you're inhaling through a bowl. But it's very I've always wondered that. Yeah, and yeah, I just do not want to ever. And then, of course, when you smoke cigarettes, which I used to do a long time ago, I wonder how much goes in that, too. You see, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? And I hope that we get to a place where we can we can check that out because that's very important. I know that um, a lab in California has done some, uh, I think just wrote a paper on um, inhaling pesticides. So... Um, that should be very interesting. But of course, the longer, you know, we get into this, the more we're going to learn about it. Well, and the thing I want to mention, too, about pesticides is if you take the broadest definition of pesticide, it's anything intended to kill pests. So safer soap, which mm. is completely non-toxic, is technically a pesticide. And that is, you know, one of the things they got busted for in Maine. Glue traps are pesticides. Right even though they don't ever touch the plant. So interesting cuz I we always think of, you know, the big plane gnarly flying pesticide, over with right. in DDT. Mexico with DDT, right. But there are very organic and inorganic pesticides that are perfectly healthy we think. And then there's other ones that have been shown to like have half-lives of 100 years. So, you know, it it's we just don't know enough. Right. And then we're again inhaling it versus eating it off a tomato. So, well, that's why I was really interested in this tobacco study when it talks about they actually test the smoke. And I wonder how they get it in a bottle. <laughs> like, well, that's just that. like, right. And, and so Headspace, that's the cool thing about Headspace. Instead of um, it, it lights it and then it's in a, um, what's that vial called? Wait, what's Headspace? Go back. Sorry. Get yeah, I, I can explain Headspace a little bit. Um, basically, it's just a a heating element. Uh, it takes our little sample in a small glass tube, heats it up to quite quite a bit of quite a bit of heat, about 150 degrees Celsius. And that increase in temperature and an increase in pressure um, correspond to a higher concentration of basically everything in the gas above the sample. So it gets trapped. Yeah. So we're taking a sample of that superheated gas, sending it through a separation column and detecting it um, with a flame ionization detection, which basically looks at the interaction of the uh, electromagnetic field around the, the sample itself. And it's important to do the, the headspace part of this application because if you were to just inject a sample of hash directly into the gas chromatograph, you wouldn't get that sort of separation of the solvents that could be inside the hash. So for instance, um, another lab is, is doing the same thing and just injecting it into the GC. And uh, the method for this even says that it's a qualitative measurement, although this person is giving a quantitative measurement. Um, so like we showed you that chromatogram, um, it gives you, uh, it doesn't co-elute, meaning the peaks are separated so you can get a good quantitative count. With just injecting into the GC, a lot of those peaks co-elute and you cannot say for sure. So that will give you a false, um, a false representation of what's actually in the sample because they're all going to pile up together and that's going to give you a false amount versus just taking one peak at a time and measuring those peaks. 
So that's very important to note. And um, the uh, GC that actually that's happening with the in the method itself says that it's a quantitative method, not qualitative, although this this person is giving quantitative data. Big problem. I, so I just looked up, it's funny, health effects of butane lighters, and everything on the first page was cannabis blogs. <laughs> like, are lighters dangerous? Yep. Uh, no, yeah, exactly. But it's it says that inhalation of butane can cause euphoria, drowsiness, narcosis, asphyxia, cardiac arrhythmia, and temporary memory loss and frostbite. And then this is there was... Um, Solvent-related deaths, this was in Britain, people were spraying butane directly into the throat. <gasps> it would freeze their throat, and they call it sudden sniffer's death syndrome. Oh, my First God. First described in 1970, and it is the single most common cause of solvent-related death, resulting in 55% known fatal cases. But <sighs> but there's I can't is find anything Is that huffing, on, too? Yeah. Is that what huffing is? I would think so. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. So I saw an intervention once. Um, this girl, she was in medical school, met this guy, and he was a huffer. And she started huffing and 20 cans of computer cleaner a day. 20 cans. And they started catching on to her, obviously. And, and she would have a hard time buying it. But literally, and she would just sit there and, and just huff. It was the most disgusting thing I've ever well, seen. Well, if it causes life. euphoria. For two seconds, like not worth it. Well, no, no, no. It's okay, it's worth it, but that's you know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's like uh, nitrous, you know. Right, exactly nitrous. But um, anyway, so back to the headspace. Yeah, so headspace suggesting the space at the head of the vial, the gas at the head of the vial. So that's how you can visualize the headspace. Um, but it's fascinating. It's very fascinating, and. Um, we're learning more and more, and actually Chris is doing some um, edibles that we specifically told somebody to make dirty, if you will, or leave some solvents in there, so we're looking at that right now. Um, but Chris, you've done such a great job. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thanks for having me. Um, it's a very uh, a huge step for us, and your phone is going nuts, I know. Jill. <laughs> or is it your... Never mind. <laughs> Uh, um anyway so then we hope to have um we hope to have pesticides terpenes and um microbials all this year preparing for 2014 when um it will be mandated to test your product uh, in colorado which is great because um i got a question the other day and we just we just assume that people know things, okay? And of course they can't. How would they know things? But we know things because we're dead, in the dead center of this industry. Well, my um, friend the other day drove by a dispensary that I will remain nameless, and it said, top shelf, $189 an ounce. And um, it, you get what you pay for. Let's just say that. Um, there are very few places I would buy flour from, to be honest, in this state. But on the other hand, some people here grow the best flour in the world. I guarantee that. Um, I want to have another conversation, too, and, and this is about potency. Um, you know, potency has gone up drastically in the last three years. Uh, I would say average probably was around nine before uh, a couple of years ago, and now we see it more around 15. Now, again, these are people that test. So um, it's the results are skewed a little bit because people that test tend to grow a little bit of better product as we can. I mean, well, as yeah, we're you, assuming, improve, right? Right. You get a test and you go, hmm, right. I'm going to tweak this, play with that. So um, when we come back from break, I want to talk about. Um, how potency has gone up and how people are skeptical about it when we come back. Counterpunch is a delicious and effective medical marijuana beverage proudly made right here in Colorado. 
Each bottle is freshly infused with 100% pure flower extract from the highest grade marijuana plants available today. Using proprietary extraction methods, every bottle of Canapunch is consistently and reliably infused with an exact milligram dosage that you can count on to relieve your symptoms each and every time. Canapunch is delicious. There's never any medicine-y taste. We use only 100% cannabis flowers. No trim or byproducts are ever used in Canapunch. It does not require refrigeration and comes in convenient, resealable multi-dose bottles from 60 milligrams to 200 milligrams we have drinks with dosage that works best for you canna punch is available in a variety of delicious flavors like black cherry watermelon pineapple mango and blue raspberry and we now have strain specific beverages available just for you canna punch is delicious convenient consistent and effective give it a try and experience the canna punch difference Ivita Wellness is committed to compassionate patient care while providing the highest quality medicine at an affordable price. At Ivita Wellness, patients can get top shelf ounces for $150 every day. Ivita Wellness also carries pharmaceutical grade pure CO2 oil. Ivita Wellness is located in Uptown Denver on 1616 Pearl Street. Open seven days a week from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. You can reach us at 303 303- Nine five two nine one five zero, or our website at www.ivitawellness.com. Ivita Wellness is Denver's Compassionate Care Center. This segment was brought to you by The Farm, a medical marijuana care center located at 2801 Iris Street in Boulder. The Farm carries premium cannabis, edibles, and hummingbird brand products. Visit our new cannabis lifestyle store for your local artesian glass, vaporizers, and hemp clothing. The Farm has been serving Boulder since 2009. Isn't it time you come and see what we have to offer? I'm Gary Johnson, and you're listening to iCannabis Radio, and I want to say, talk it up, Colorado. Anyway, so I was talking to somebody the other day, and so ta- speaking of THC averages, fairly high, and um, Can Labs has experienced two samples over 30%. And one was very recent, and it was a home grow, um, which I believe um, clearly it's easier to grow a home grow uh, with all TLC than it is, you know, on a larger scale. So I definitely believe that. Well, anyway, I was speaking with this person in the industry, and they said they called BS on that and said that um, they didn't believe that anything over 26% THC. And, you know, I I just have to disagree with that. One, because we have such amazing nutrients, different lighting now, um, different overall education on growing this plant, better genetics. I mean, better all around that I definitely have seen a rise um, in potency. And, you know, at Can Labs, if a sample is 25% and over, meaning active, we reprep and rerun that sample just to make sure because you never know. But, um, you know, we've had our fair share over 25% and, and usually from the same but that, place, I mean, it's but. logical, too, because if you look at how much CBD has gone up, because people are looking for it, and they're isolating it, and they're breeding right. it. So, you know, when I, when I first started 2008, 2009, you know, we didn't have anything that was 1% CBD, let alone right. 12. Or 20. So in four years, we've seen it go from nothing to 20. 20. Yeah, one person I have for 20. Well, and what's interesting about the CBD thing is I remember my my first high CBD test. It was 7%, and I almost fell off my chair. Like, I called the client. I'm like, oh, my God, you're not going to believe what you have. I mean, it was it was phenomenal. And then there was another client, too, that had close to 7 And guess what? He's like, oh, well, no one liked that. We gave that away. Well, no one liked it because it wasn't the typical high. One and two, they they aren't what's considered a good looking or pretty plant. So a lot of people probably had CBD and got rid of it. Um, That's one thing I want to do a show on too, which is tissue culture and whether yes. or not it works. Because I mean, part of the problem you mean growing a plant from tissue culture, right? Okay, because part of the problem we have is limited space in Colorado, and we're doing it mostly indoors because of the rules and the regs. Keeping a mother plant is highly, highly expensive. And so growers are constantly, like, they only have so much room for their mothers. Okay, so back up for the mother. Uh, Well, the mother plant is the 
the mother, um, the life giver. You keep this plant to clone. You never fully so flower clone her. Means- She's um, clone is you take a cutting to repropagate. You're, you're okay. getting into science on me. Repropagate well, no, the plant. But, like you yeah. literally take a cutting, you um, put it in a medium until it grows roots, and then you transplant it, and then you transplant it again. And so the mother, you never flower. You never finish her. So oh, okay. I see, I didn't even in, know that. When you're in veg, um, you have a constant light so- source instead of going to 12 to 12. So once you turn off the lights for 12 hours or 16, however you decide to do it, um, it will start to flower, oh, and that gives you buds. Okay. And if you're constantly keeping them under light, they never flower. And oh, so you do this I for see. so the electricity keeping those mu- gotcha. And they're big girls. They're big. You want them healthy. It costs nutrient. Like these are your moms. But when you are doing this for commercial purposes, or even at home, when you have a limited six plants, sure, we can't keep mothers. So we need clone banks. <laughs> Like, we really do. And so tissue culture, and we're way off topic now. Chris is like, why am I here? Um, (laughs) No, it's okay. um, But (laughs) tissue culture is literally taking um, a little bit of genetic sample from the plant, storing it in a test tube, and then being able to re-veg. And lots of people talk about this. I just haven't talked to enough people to know if it works. So hold on a second. So what do you put in the test tube? A medium and then the clone? No, like some solution and a, just a little tiny cut of your mother. Like, like a tiny little... Yeah, the genetics. The, the It's like... In some kind of medium and a test tissue cloning. Too. It's like we do okay. with human cells. Humans, right, right. Yeah. And I know no one... I would love to find out more information. Well, wasn't that what Bob was doing, right, from Full Spectrum? I thought he was working on some of that. I think so. And, and that was one of the things which actually when we talk about labs and maybe you can address this a little bit, I know that operators are a little hesitant to give their genetics to labs because sure. they're scared they're going to steal them. Sure. And there was discussions about that. So, But ethically and by good lab practice, you can't do that, correct? Well, sure. I mean, you can steal genetics, you bet. But that's that's never been an interest of can labs. And in fact, when I was starting out and I was green, um, that's one of the things that that ne- came naturally to tell people was I wanted to be a third party independent lab that I have I have no interest in you know, making products and selling them. And I don't own a dispensary. And I think that's very important. I have no um, I have no, um, um, I can't even think of the affiliation. word affiliation, affiliation, but no, I don't care. You know, at the very beginning, people would just get so upset about their results and stuff. Um, and I just, you know, I'm like, and, and immediately they think it's the lab. Oh, well, it can't be me. Cause I'm an amazing grower. Um, but <laughs> as we know, that is that is definitely not true. There are a lot of people who have been growing for a long time that have absolutely no idea what they're doing. But um, again, we just we want to we want safe and effective medicine and now adult products um, for the consumer. That's all we want to do. So do not. Um, when my lab techs ask a lot of times. How'd you make this? What'd you make this with? And that's only to be able to analyze it better. Um, it is not because we're interested uh, in any of that. But of course, you can back. But again, if we want to do that, I could have went to your store and bought your stuff. I mean, right? <laughs> right? I'll just get somebody to come and get your stuff. So, um, but yeah, I just want people to know that that I that I have no affiliation, never did, never will, and I and I've actually had people ask me to change results, and I was horrified. I'm like, why would you even get it tested then? But then, you know. We went through that period where um, supposedly people were giving higher results. And, you know, of course, you're going to use the lab with higher results. I had a client come in, flipped out. Oh, my God, your results are wrong. Well, how come? Well, because this other lab was 100 milligrams more. Oh, so then we're automatically wrong. Um, it, you know, it's, it, it, it's ridiculous, but that's kind of the state of the affairs right now. And I can't wait until, you know, we get regulated so people cannot accuse my instrumentation or my lab techs or whatever, uh, that were, that were inaccurate because we're not. And we take a ton, we, we do a ton of things in order to be accurate 
like, you know, getting pipettes calibrated, scales calibrated by third parties to come in and tell us, you know, we, I get all of my methods checked, you know, and I, in the process of getting things validated. But um, I'll tell you what, it's definitely, uh, it's been very tough. <laughs> but, you know, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, and all the new states coming on are mandating testing, too. And, of course they um, are. You know, the industry did a pretty good job of convincing our regulators that testing wasn't accurate and they didn't need testing. And, um, you know, we have no pesticide restrictions here, except you can't use EPA-banned chemicals, which technically can't right. be on shelves anywhere, so you couldn't if you tried. Which I've seen raid in grows. Yeah. Yeah. Raid. There's See people like diametic the, earth, which is just like this like shell stuff that works just as good. I know, but <laughs> it's, it's so sad that um, unfortunately, again, back to the safe and effective medicine is patients just assume that they read a label and that's what's on it. And I was the same way, like with nutraceuticals, five hour energy or any of those, you know, I believe the label and, and the point is that that what's on the label in the cannabis industry most likely is not what you're getting. Um, you know, it's not. And it's really sad. And that's why legalization is going to help with this, mandate it, and keep people accountable. Um, you know, I'm sick of sick of hearing, oh, well, you know, you're not regulated, so you can't be giving us the right answer when that's that's BS. That's absolutely BS. And I can prove to you why my uh, results are accurate and consistent. So anyway, um, we got on a way tangent. <laughs> I never do Chris, that. our producer is like, oh, don't worry, girls, you got it. You'll go <laughs> off on some tangent. <laughs> and now Chris Peck is t here to see that. <laughs> um, so we got about five more minutes, right? Four more minutes. So what do you, are there any other things you wanted to pitch in about residual solvent or testing or anything? Yeah, the whole residual solvent and safety testing in this industry is really still in its infancy. And True the, that. the most help, the, the most influen influential thing that can be done right now is for patients to demand that this sort of testing to be done. Because th right now with no regulation, there's no... Uh, incentive. Exactly. There's no incentive to have any sort of potency or quality How testing about done. wanting to sell, you know, wanting to sell a good product? I know oh. that you can't talk about who tests with you. I wonder if you could get their permission because I think it's important for people to know, like, I know a lot of operators get something tested once, especially in MIPS. And that's their number forever. 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 And, and I'll give you a horror story about that. So Patients back in the day. Patients need to learn to ask and, and recreational buyers, like, where's your test results? Let me see the date. The date. Because they do expire. We give two months um, because people, every harvest have different numbers. Now, um, but the but the edibles is, is is really incredible. And I've seen, yeah, test reports. But here's, here's what the bottom line is with that. Company A got 100 pounds of trim, right? And they don't process it all at once, right? So they process a certain amount um, into hash. And they test that, and that came out at 70%. So they just assumed that every batch they would make off that 100 pounds of trim would be 70%. Well, they started getting complaints on their edibles from dispensary owners. And so they came back to me and said, well, what is it? And I said, well, you have to touch test every batch of oil or you have to mix your batches very, very good. Um, so they're all, um, you know, mixed together and then give a sample. But what happened was she went back, she tested another batch that came off that same trim and it was 50%. So no wonder. I mean, her her formula just completely took a crapper going from 70% THC to 50% THC and was still using that same formula. So you cannot test one batch. You have to test every batch, whatever that means. And I understand testing is a cost, but it's, but it's a cost of doing business. And, you know, it may just be a matter of mixing your batches together. So if you have any questions as an edible company, please call us. We want to 
Um, we're there for you, but we know that you will improve your product, you'll improve your reputation, and you will save money by testing in the end. So, um, but that is that is true. People just think, oh, it's the same trend. It's going to be the same batch of hash. It's it's just not right. And the sleight of hand. Um, every time you make hash, it's it's man-made so it's not going to be the same as if it was made in a in an instrument if that was possible right right so i don't know anyway <laughs> and uh, <laughs> chris is giving me the oh boy, we're almost done thank sponsors. god our sponsors yes so one of our wonderful sponsors dixie elixirs they test everything and they have products from their truffle that won uh, a place in the High Times Cannabis Cup last year and also the Hem Connoisseur Contest. Uh, then we have Avita, which is actually where Chris came from. He shopped at Avita and um, was looking for uh, some science-related jobs and found Can Labs, which thank God. So I'll always thank Avita for that. But they're a great dispensary. They only carry uh, products that... Um, that test and say what they are on the package. Then we have the farm, which is another great dispensary in Boulder. She uh, is an incredible woman and it's a very, very exciting. Have you been to our new location up there? I have not yet. It's awesome. I'm sure it is. It's a standalone building. So it's really easy to park. Um, and uh, just wonderful people. there. Boulder, very knowledgeable. Important. Yeah, in Boulder, that's important because, God, Boulder. Anywho. Um, then we have the Incredibles, uh, which are the most amazing chocolate bars ever. Um, I actually sought them out to become my customer because I w was just fascinated by how great these candy bars were. Then we have Greenworks, home of the R4, which is a very high CBD strain. They're going to be giving out seeds at the Cannabis Cup. Thank you, Greenworks. Then we have Canisher, which is insurance for the cannabis industry. They've been in the insurance um, business for years and years and years and found all the problems that people were having when they were paying good policy and then something happens and then they get dropped as a client. So uh, please look into Canisher. Then we also have Canapunch, a wonderful drink. Uh, that gives you just a different buzz than other drinks. And I don't know what it is about Can of Punch, but it's also very potent and tastes amazing. Mango, pineapple, black cherry, yum, yum, yum. Am I forgetting anyone? Chris? Mm -mm, no. no? Blue Sage. Oh, my God. My favorite, Blue Sage. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Blue Sage Microbes, an incredible growing system that starts off with nutrients. And the reason why it's so important is they went and uh, bought a bunch of nutrients and tested them and found out really quickly that nutrients do not have consistent um, ingredients, which drastically they need to be tested too. Soil yes, can come you can get hot soil. Yes, contaminated soil, you have to test your soil pH every time you get it. Every bag is not the same. That's and right. That's where a lot of growers can have problems too. Right. So it's very important that you keep things consistent. And uh, that's what Blue Sage Microbes will do for you. And we'll get more personal with Blue Sage because Jill's uh, husband is using them. So we're going to get we're a side by side. Side by side with two either. Well, two clones from the same mother. Mm -hmm. So, and we'll be able to, because Mike uses kind of a similar microbial system. So it'll be interesting to see right. how they look side by side. And Blue Sage is extremely generous and kicked in extra money because the DC plane tickets are <laughs> outrageous. Thank you expensive. so much, Blue Sage. We mm -hmm. truly appreciate that. And so, so did our winner. So it's going to be very exciting. I'm not going to be here next week. Jill will be here. And then the week after, we're hoping to do um, more uh, more information on hash, the differences in hashes, in different hashes, waxes, shatter, and what it all means. Um, I'm hopefully going to have uh, one of the hash makers for the clinic, or I should say the hash maker for the clinic, Nelson, and then also uh, Nick Tanum, who makes uh, solventless 
hash, and he can talk about why that's called solventless um, versus bubble hash. Which is well, which is water yeah, hash. My favorite is. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, Nick Tanum, you know, talk about what I really want to get to the bottom of is stripping off the can- the cannabinoids. You know, people think it's propane, butane. But uh, he does a, an extremely good job, and he's had some extremely high results oh, on his, his yeah. solventless wax. Now, he's been doing it for years and years and years and years and years, so hopefully he can talk more about that. And Chris, thank you so much for coming. Hopefully you'll come again, and we'll let you talk. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks for having me. <laughs> All right. Like Monday morning. Monday see morning. On, like, see? Friday afternoon. But I'm on fire in the mornings, way more than the afternoon. Okay, got to go. <laughs> Bye. Bye.